Hello, everyone. Uh, I am Behruz Kamari Tabrizi. I'm the director of the Sharmin and Bijan Musawar Rahmani Center for Iran and Persian Gulf Studies at uh, Princeton University. And uh, it gives me such a great pleasure today uh, to have this conversation um, about the effects of sanctions on uh, reform movement uh, in Iran. But before we um, uh, introduce our guests, uh, let me go over some logistics. Um, after the introduction, uh, I, um, um, ask, I will ask our guests to present their work for around 40 minutes or so, 35, 40 minutes. And, um, and then we'll have a conversation and open the screen for your questions. You can submit your questions through the Q&A button uh, on the uh, lower side of your screen. You can submit the questions and I would uh, read and pose the questions to our very special guests. Um, uh, this uh, meeting was in the making for a long time and, uh, and uh, it's uh, one of those uh, unintended consequences of uh, of COVID restrictions that uh, we were able to have these kinds of meetings from by uh, guests who are joining us from all over the world. And today, Professor uh, Javad Heiran Nia, the director of the Persian Gulf Studies Group at the Center for Scientific Research and Middle East Strategic Studies from Tehran is joining us. Um, uh, Dr. Heiran Nia, um, has uh, been uh, very uh, prolific in the past uh, uh, few years, writing uh, for journals such as Middle East Policy, uh, Cambridge University Middle East and North Africa Forum, um, Middle East Studies Quarterly, and many other uh, important journals of uh, policy and international relations. He has written commentaries uh, widely uh, from uh, Newsweek uh, in the United States to Asahi in Japan and in between for Tehran Times and uh, Mir News Agency. Um, uh, he's working on a book project, Persian Gulf's Security Orders, and his um, articles uh, has uh, appeared again in um, Cambridge University Middle East North Africa Forum, uh, the latest one, uh, the enduring and growing strength of Iran's look to the East foreign policy, uh, which was just uh, published uh, very recently. Um, joining uh, Dr. Heiran Nia uh, from San Francisco, uh, Professor Mahmoud Munshipur, uh, Munshipuri, Professor of International Relations at San Francisco State University and also a, uh, an important member of the Global Studies and International and Area Studies at University of California, Berkeley. His edited volume uh, left a uh, significant mark, uh, came out in 2016 inside the Islamic Republic, Social Change in Post-Khomeini Iran, published by Oxford University Press, and his forthcoming book, In the Shadow of Mistrust, The Geopolitics and Diplomacy of Iran-U.S.-Iran Relations, also uh, Oxford University Press, will be released uh, very soon in May, and hopefully, crossing our fingers, the COVID uh, restrictions would be lifted by next fall and would, we would um, invite uh, Professor Munshipuri to come to Princeton in person for a uh, book conversation after the book is uh, released. So I'll stop here and, uh, and again with uh, many thanks uh, to our guests who accepted our invitation and, uh, and presenting their work uh, today on the effects of sanctions on uh, reform movement in Iran. And uh, the screen is yours. Thank you, Behruz Jan. Hello, all the screen is. 
audiences, I would like to thank Dr. Gamari Tabrizi and Sharmin and Bijan Musabar Rahmani Center for Iran and Persian Gulf Studies of Princeton University for this invitation and opportunity. I am very delighted to be, to be among the distinguished professors and researchers I had the honor of working with and learning from Professor Munshipuri in the common work on Iran's middle class. I will discuss the erosion of a middle class in Iran and its internal and foreign consequences. And Professor Munshi Puri will focus on the role of sanctions on weakening of this class in Iran. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, let me start with the significance of a modern middle class. In a brief historical look examining the socio-political developments in Iran, especially after the constitutional revolution, we see the importance of, uh, of the middle class. And this can be seen until the Iran 1979 revolution and Islamic Republic of Iran's developments. This class united with the upper class in constitutional revolution and, the and the, in 1979 revolution, lower class joined it to this class. And this class had a major role in the 1997 presidential election that won Khatami and played an influential role in the 2005 election that won Ahmadinejad by not participating. 2013, that one Rohani by participating, and 2021, that one Raisi again, but not participating. The next slide, please. The ebb and flow of the middle class power. During Hashmi Rafsanjani president, we saw the threatening of the new. Uh, uh, or modern middle class in Iran. Rafsanjani's economic development policy on one hand led to expansion of higher education and the new intellectual and increasing middle class population. And on the other hand, the lack of freedoms for political participation of the educated classes and eliminated the intelligentsia from the political system for this reason, Rafsanjani's government was unaware of the impact of modernization on politics and this unbalanced development, according to Samuel Huntington, led to victory of Khatami in the next election, whose slogan was to open the political, political space both inside and outside the country. Between 1997 and 2005, the new middle class, from intellectuals to political parties, journalists, technocrats in ministries and governmental departments came to power. Next slide, please, Professor Munshipuri. Uh, income classes. The deterioration of the economic situation on one hand and frustration of this class from political system on the other hand had, has led to the result of the recent parliamentary and presidential elections in Iran and victory of Ibrahim Raisi. As you can see in this slide, the middle class income has declined sharply when Trump's withdraw from the JCPOA. I am sure Professor Moishipuri will point out this in more details. It should be noted that the performance of the reformists themselves and their gradual removal from power over the past year and the presence of reformists in power who are not the real representative of the middle class in Iran led to middle class political non-participation in the recent elections. The performance of reformists in power has caused reformist theories like Behezad Nabavi and Said Hajarian to consider them opportunists. Next slide, please. 
Raisi and the future of the middle class. The removal of the reformists and moderates from the power structure has also affected their supporting classes. By presence of conservatives in the government of Raisi, they controlled most governmental and non-governmental institutions, even quasi-democratic institutions that were previously controlled by reformists. After the coming of Khatami to power, the position of reformists in the power structure was strengthened. Gradually, the reform movement shrank and was removed from the power structure. The same thing happened to their supporter class, I mean the middle class. After Raisi came to the power, we are witnessing the undermining of social body of the reformists very fast. However, the gradual removal of reformists, especially after the protest against result of Iran presidency in 2000, Nine has been pursued and intensified in the government of Raisi. One of the reasons is the issue of next successor of Iranian leader Ayatollah Khamenei. Next slide, please. Budget of revolutionary institutions. Strengthening conservative institutions have been evident in the budget of Raisi government. As you can see in this slide, and the blue column according to 2022 budget bill, we saw a significant increase in the budget of revolutionary institutions such as IRGC and the Islamic Republic of Iran Broadcasting, IRIB. Blue column show that the budget of IRGC has increased more than 2.5 times compared to the previous year. We are also witnessing 56 present increase in the budget of the IRIB. This budget will also put more pressure on poor and middle classes. Kamran Nadri, director of the Islamic Banking Group at the Central Bank of Iran said the 2022 budget put a lot of pressure on the middle class and a large part of this class falls into low-income vessels. The government has completely ignored the inflation and has not considered any compensation for it. In this budget, while salaries will increase by 10%, inflation will increase by 50%. In this regard, Dr. Hashem Pesaran believes that the most effective way to crush the middle class is to place them between the two millstones, inflation and tax. I would like to draw your attention to another important phenomenon, middle class migration. This issue will further weaken the reformist position in the future. According to Iran's Minister of Health, 3,000 medical doctors left Iran last year. He warned that if the trend is not stopped, the country's health system can face a serious crisis. Some conservatives have responded to this trend by telling, if you don't like us, leave the country. Next slide, please. Internal consequences of weakening of the middle class. The weakening of the middle class has significant internal effects, which I will explain in the next three slides. The non-participation of the middle class, which is also reference group, caused people who political culture is a subordinate political culture, according to Gabriel Almond, not to participate in the elections. And finally, we saw the lowest part political participation rate in the recent parliamentary and presidential elections after the Iran revolution. During the absence of civil society, new forces have entered the social developments, which are the poorest and marginalized classes of society who previously did not play many roles in social developments. 
at present many of middle class members are moved to the lower class and its demand are focused on livelihood instead of political development. This makes their demands radical. According to Asif Bayat, professor, University of Illinois, the current middle class in Iran can be better explained by the concept of the middle class poor. According to him, the feeling of ignored dark future, the awareness of prevailing corruption in political structures and the livelihood crisis made this class angry. In the few months since Raisi came to power, we have witnessed widespread and frequent protests by teachers in different parts of Iran. The issue also, the issue also causes the society to move toward bipolarity, a massive poor class and a small rich class. Class conflict also causes insecurity and creates other costs for society and political system. This is why Aristotle gave this class an important role in creating stability in society. Next slide, please. The of a middle class and the lack of a role in society will cause a kind of uniformity in the political structure. It is that is the power structure will be completely in the hands of the conservatives. Conservatives who also control the parliament and judiciary. This imposed threat to political system because a large part of Iran's population does not have representative in political structure to advance their demands. In this regard, let us recall the warning of Francis Fukuyama and the call of the American left parties to present the scattered identities in the United States. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, the, pro the process of marginalization of reformists had already begun. In this regard, former President Khatami noted, I am disappointed with the future of the country and the political arena. And I believe that the system will severely limit reformist political activities. It's appeared that the system has passed us. Khatami goes on to say, we must move toward community-based reforms and the implementation of educational activity with the aim of long-term work. This shows that the reformists are no longer able to influence the power structure of Iran and have focused on society-based approach. Next slide, please. Foreign policy of look uh, to the east. The shrink of the middle class has not only internal effects, it has impacts on foreign policy that will be long-term. We will be see this effect in the continuation and intensify of the policy of look to the east in the coming years. Although Iran, Iran's foreign policy is largely regulated by the establishment and leader, and in fact, the president in foreign policy is the agent of higher institutions, including the Supreme National Security Council, the role of president in foreign policy cannot be ignored. In fact, the president has to follow some of the demands of supporting social body in foreign policy, or at least it is necessary to pursue a kind of foreign policy that in addition to overcoming domestic problems in the line with the slogans it has put forward to solve problem at the domestic level. One variable that strengthened the policy of a look to the East in Raisi government was the erosion of middle class. The middle class is, is not Raisi's supportive class and he does not concern about them. The modern middle class in foreign policy supports relation with the West and in relation to the East calls for a balanced relation. 
the erosion of the middle class will have a long-term effects on for the future. The effect of this issue can be seen in the continuation of look to the east and the strengthening of relation with China and Russia on the 25 and 20 years cooperation respectively. At present, anyone who speak about the balance, balanced foreign policy and criticize the unbalanced relationship with Russia and China will face the criticism. Earlier, Javad Zarif criticized Russia's negative role in the nuclear talks. His remark about Russia met with widespread opposition from conservatives. In fact, the intensification of this approach in the racist government is due to erosion of middle class and reformists. Look to the East also means strengthening the value system of conservatives because cooperation with Russia and China, in addition to meeting some economic, political, military needs of Iran, will boost the conservative value system and as a supporter of ruling system in internal crisis situations. At the end, I would like to quote Machiavelli. In his book, Discourses, Machiavelli argues that it was conflict that made Rome free and powerful. He even says that good laws arise from the turmoil that result from the division of desires between those who want to dominate elites and those do not want to be dominated people. I hope that through this turmoil in Iran's middle class, we will see the formation of good laws. Uh, let me stop here and turn it uh, over to pre Professor Moshipuri. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Herania, for this highly suggestive and educational uh, uh, presentation. Uh, I'd like to uh, focus on uh, the uh, U.S. sanctions and their impact on the middle class. But before I do, my great thanks to uh, uh, Dr. Amaria Tapizi and also to the Center for Iranian Studies at Princeton University. And uh, my deep gratitude to Becky and Pete, who have been very, very helpful in terms of uh, coordinating this meeting. Um, let me start out by making some points of clarification. There are a number of factors involved in explaining Iran's economic decay. And they could range from economic mismanagement to corruption, to unemployment, inflation, and on the top of that, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and you know, it's very hard to disaggregate all these interrelated factors, but nevertheless, we have decided to kind of focus on one aspect of this uh, situation, and that is the sanctions. Our focus are gonna be on the impacts of the sanction, but by no means do we intend to undermine the significance of the agency of the ruling elites in Iran who are in a position of making decisions. So therefore, uh, there are a lot of problems that middle class have to do with mismanagement uh, and, and uh, we don't really uh, put all the onus on, on the sanctions. But it is important to mention that sanctions have actually played a very important role. With that in mind, let me start with the presidency of the Trump administrations, and uh, and uh, I would like to start with Michael Pompeo's tool demands on Iran, which, in my view, no sovereign states would have actually accept all those you know twelve conditions. You know, I mean, just uh, uh, the, some of those conditions were like stop enrichment program and 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 stop the uh, Iranian ballistic missile. Uh, program which is extremely key to their defense system, or stop supporting its proxies in Lebanon, Iraq, and, and Syria, and other places. Not to mention uh, Yemen and and uh, and Palestine, and so on and so forth. Or one of the, one of the conditions was withdrawal from uh, from Syria and so on and so forth. So I think that Mike Pompeo's twelve demands on Iran actually did not carry the day. And then came the pulling out of the Iran nuclear deal by President Trump and imposing on Iran the so-called maximum pressure to bring Iran to the negotiating table or create some kind of you know, 
a change in the foreign policy conduct of Iran. Uh, I'm afraid that none of this uh, uh, actually were accomplished, uh, and and uh, the uh, the Trump administration's uh, uh, sanctions on Iran actually did not bring Iranian to the negotiating table. They did not cause any foreign policy change in the conduct of the Iranian foreign policy in the region, and 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 actually did not uh, achieve anything as far as I'm concerned. Uh, what they did, they actually uh, destroyed the Iranian uh, reformist movement from within. Let me start with the sanctions. Uh, since the spring of 2018, when the, President Trump uh, pulled out of the JCPOA, another formal name for the nuclear deal, Iranian real has lost 68% uh, of its value. In March 2020, inflation hit around 41%. These are official figures, by the way. Maybe the, the, the actual figures are much higher than that. Today, as of the last time I checked that the inflation hovers around 30%, I'm absolutely sure it's above that. The GDP has shrunk by 6.5%. In 2020, unemployment rate stood at almost 11%. I'm absolutely, absolutely sure that it is higher than that. Uh, let me stay with the, the narrative of the sanctions and its impact on on uh, Iranian uh, uh, economic uh, writ large, at large. The sanctions erased one of the nuclear deal's most important dividends for Iran. When Iran entered into the nuclear deal and accept to be in full compliance with the nuclear deal, it was hoping that not only the sanctions on oil industry are removed, but also it could invite foreign uh, investment and, 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 and it could lead to job creations that will then open the possibilities for Iran to get into international market. My good friend, uh, Dr. Saleh Yasfani at Virginia Tech argues that I mean, it's not all about oil, but the key is for Iran to invite foreign direct investment and also actually trade with other countries. Middle class in Iran today is simply too preoccupied with economic survival, to be effective politically, to go to the street, to be at the vanguard of reformist movement. Today, middle class is prioritizing its economic security ahead of democratic freedoms. And in, in that fundamental sense, I would argue that Iran's vibrant and resilient civil society is gradually disappearing right before our own eyes. Middle class population, I'm going to give you some data. Middle, middle class population in Iran has decreased by 10% from uh, almost 58% uh, in 2011 to 40, almost roughly 49% in uh, 2019. Approximately as a result, 8 million of Iran's middle-class population has seen their per capita income sharply decline since 2011. Middle-class makes up approximately 35% of the total population, which is um, 85 million. That is roughly 30% uh, that 30, uh, 30 million people. According to the Statistical Center of Iran, you know, published in October 2020, almost half of the Iranian population live be below the poverty line. And this is a country that is oil rich. This is a country that, as we say in the hardness and lexicon of, of, of the political science, this is a rentier state. This is a state that lives off, uh, lives off of the oil. And then in this country, when you have 50% of the Iranian population living below the poverty line, it's absolutely perplexing and puzzling. Almost half of Iran's middle class, which we said that's approximately 30 million, half of them, nearly 50 million, today live below the poverty line. I mean, what is the definition of poverty line? Well, the last I checked, it was something around like, you know, $5,000, uh, uh, 5,400 something, according to uh, the World Bank, of for a family of four, and uh, and uh, this is the so-called sort of the, the annual income of that family, and and you have uh, nearly fifty percent of the Iranian population living below that poverty line. The new sanctions have led to rapidly rising uh, uh, poverty rate across the country from uh, eight percent in two thousand seventeen to twelve percent in 2019. That 4%, as mere, you know, as meager and, uh, you know, as small as it may look to you, has really meant that approximately 3.2 million 
of Iranians have fallen under the, the poverty line. Let me specifically focus on the impact of sanctions on women. Why women? Because women in Iran have been among the most important driver for social change. Our, our, our women in Iran are among the most accomplished women to the best of my knowledge uh, throughout the Middle East. And today the Middle East class women in Iran is actually as a category is disappearing. And although women outnumber uh, men and university enrollment, uh, you know, to the extent that one sees the, the data, almost 60 to 64% of the graduates from universities are females. You know, they graduate from university, they go in the job market and they will find it very hard to compete uh, against men in the, in the market. So there are internal reasons for that. It, it, it is not really related to the sanctions. Um, uh, let me quote from uh, Ms. Faizé Tarakouli, who is a historian with the Institute of Humanities and Cultural Studies in Tehran. She says that the pressure on women on the middle class is absolutely oppressive. And then she goes on to say that she finds a justification or the sanctions uh, utterly unpersuasive. And certainly not from a feminist uh, point of view. And then she goes on to argue that you cannot tell people to starve and then seek freedom. You cannot starve people and then uh, hope that they will be active on the streets promoting uh, democratic causes. The dismantling of Iran's economy and its people's livelihood has adversely affected the lives of the very constituents very force that has been at the vanguard and forefront of reform, civil society, democratic rights, liberalization, and on and on. And this is the constituency. This is a segment of the population in whose name the former Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, spoke in terms of freedom and democratic values that is the middle class Iranian women. These sanctions have significantly diminished women's whatever fragile gains they have achieved, maybe in employment, to some extent in upper management positions, and certainly in leadership roles, especially in education and arts and so on and so forth. While at the same time, these sanctions have undermined considerably the capacity of this segment of the population to actually seek political and economic reforms and, and protection. Uh, let, me, uh, let me talk about the implications of uh, these sanctions before I conclude my remarks. Uh, what we have seen as a result of sanctions, we have seen the uh, slow death and demise of the reform movement in Iran. And my good colleague, Dr. Hirania, had a wonderful and very touching a quotation from former president that actually said, you know, it appears that the system has actually passed off. The, the system is no longer giving reformists any legitimate chance to compete and, 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 and promote democratic value. And I echo the same sentiment. Sanction policy has alienated uh, Iran's middle class, which always been, you know, from the Pahlavi era to the present. And a lot of you know, uh, uh, praise should go to the Pahlavi era for promoting secular middle class, for uh, actually giving middle class and, and a lot of opportunities to, uh, uh, to, uh, to move in terms of uh, social mobility and, and uh, in terms of actually uh, empowering middle class. Uh, a lot of credit should go to the battle of Iraq. So we saw that uh, in the, uh, under the Islamic Republic, we saw that uh, same development continue. But today, when I look at sanctions, I am really confused, baffled, and flabbergasted by the fact that I'm not quite sure exactly what were sanctions accomplished, especially those that were reimposed under the presidency of the Trump. Sanctions have really alienated Iran's middle class. Opposition in the streets have actually dramatically reduced. 
let me give you a comparison between the type of oppositions that we saw in the streets in 1999 under the student protest and in 2009 under the so-called uh, green movement. Uh, the green movement was against the forged uh, uh, elections and sham elections that brought Ahmadinejad to uh, his second term. Uh, in 1999 and 2009, protests were largely driven by the political demands of the people. The striking contrast and difference is between the protests of 1999 and 2009 with those of 2017, 2018, 2019, and today. By contrast, the recent protests have been originally motivated by political, by economic demands. They have been about economic situations. So when you look at this trend, you cannot help but to conclude that middle class is no longer in the street fighting for its political rights. If they are joining the lower classes in the streets, it has predominantly to do with the economic uh, uh, motivations and economic motives. That's a, that is a very striking difference. And that is a very striking feature of understanding where middle class in Iran right now is stand on. Let me conclude in the remaining times that I have by ending uh, uh, talking about uh, three points. US sanctions have dramatically plunged the middle class income and power. Again, we are saying that there are so many factors involved. Poor uh, management. We have a situation in which uh, 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 you know, inflation running wild, rampant uh, inflation, pervasive corruption in the system. Uh, that is still a major issue. And again, we have to hold the leaders of Islamic Republic accountable in the name of transparency, in the name of uh, uh, mismanagement and so on and so forth. There are the agency that they have to be held accountable. But US sanctions have really precipitated the slow demise of Iran's reformist movement, so much so that the reformist movement really are on, in, in the background. And people who really hoping that there would be change with you know, elections and so on and so forth, they're losing their interest in election. If you look at the turnout in the last election that resulted in the victory of Raisi, it was really uh, uh, pathetic. So many people actually chose to go and vote with the blank voting in order to make the protest heard and, and, and seen. So U.S. sanctions have really uh, expedited the slow demise of uh, Iran's reformist movement and, and the so-called imagined political ideas of the middle class. Look to the East. I want to go back and end up exactly where Professor uh, Iranio uh, finishes his wonderful talk. Look to the East, which means basically turn to uh, predominantly China and also have uh, you know, increase its trade ties with uh, Russia and so on and so forth. Among the conservatives is, you know, is gaining tremendous uh, traction in large part because middle class is no longer active. Middle class has lost the appetite to uh, question the leadership on accountability, on transparency, and also pushing for democratic social change. And the result is we are seeing the slow marginalization of the Iranian reformist movement, which used to be at the forefront of democratic law. Let me stop here and uh, looking forward to a Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to both of you. Um, uh, if we could get uh, out of the uh, shared screen, we can carry on the conversation with a sort of a larger, yes, very good. Thank you so much. This was uh, extremely informative and uh, and at the same time, I think very puzzling. <laughs> and uh, and the, uh, I, I want to start the conversation with a uh, question that um, I've been asking a number of people 
in the policymaking circles uh, here in the US. Uh, and that question is, what the objectives from the standpoint of the State Department here, what the objectives of these sanctions are? And of course, you know, on the surface, it's, you know, starving the state into submission. <laughs> okay, but presumably there are smart people in policy circles in the US who would see that how these sanctions actually produce the opposite of stated objectives. Um, and the more these sanctions are uh, debilitating, the um, less we see the, as you so beautifully laid out, both of you, Dr. Heiranya and Munshipuri, that uh, the, uh, the less we see the significance of re uh, reform movement in Iran. And presumably they see that. They presumably they see that uh, sanctions lead to strengthening of more militant <clears throat> factions, to a strengthening of all those elements inside the um, Iranian state that presumably the sanctions are trying to weaken. <clears throat> so is there a kind of a uh, um, disjunction uh, between the stated purpose of these sanctions and possibly the real <laughs> Uh, purpose of these sanctions is the reformed uh, progressive Iranian state more desirable or <clears throat> or the more kind of radical saber rattling kind of state in Iran um, which presumably the sanctions is sort of helping to the emergence of the latter so uh, I wonder if you can speculate on that. I mean, like, don't people see in the US government the opposite effects of these sanctions? Professor Irania, would you like to speak to that first? I think uh, you can better address to this question <laughs> of Sir Munshikuri. Thank you so much. Oh, this is a wonderful question, Dr. Reisen. This is a, a, a superb question. Uh, the disconnect, as you said, and rightly so, is where, you know, when you think that sanctions will work, but they are backfiring in the sense that uh, Iranian, believe it or not, have shown that they are very resilient in uh, getting around the sanction. In fact, the uh, there is a committee in Iran's central bank whose job is on daily basis to find ways to bypass the sanctions. And what the sanctions do is definitely put the pressure on the vast majority of Iranians without achieving what is called regime change or bringing Iran to the negotiating table. Yes. I grant the fact that, that the pressure on economic pressure on Iran in 2014, you know, 15 brought Iranians to the uh, nuclear deal table. And, and uh, but it was not the only reason that came to the, that Iranians came to the negotiating table. They found the other side as a partner who's not interested in regime change. They found a partner in the United States that said that, you know, you could have your enrichment program. We don't intend to stop it. It says you're right. You're entitled to do that. Under the uh, uh, IAEA, you, are, you, know, you have all the rights in the world to do that. And uh, uh, you are part of non-proliferation treaty. Therefore, you are entitled to do that. And, and the result was that the Iranians came to the negotiating table. And they signed something and they stayed in full compliance with it till Trump administration comes and reimposes further sanction. Um, Robert Pape, I'm sure you're familiar with his writings, University of Chicago, long time ago, 1997, wrote a very uh, interesting article in which he said why sanctions don't work. Mm -hmm. They don't work because if the intended purpose of them is the regime change, 
I wonder how many examples of regime change we have in the world. Maybe not, you cannot even count five of them. I don't know, sanctions work in Malaya, sanctions work in South Africa, they work. But, but for the most part, look at the sanctions today that are going to be directed at Putin with regard to crisis in Ukraine. I am absolutely sure that Putin has actually thought through this. You know, they, they know that they're gonna be subject to sanctions, but they know that, you know, there are some countries like France and Germany are dependent on gas and so on and so forth, and it could actually be divisive in Europe. So sanctions, if they are not carefully and meticulously calculated and targeted, they could punish the very same people that they intend to rescue. Thank you so much. We have a question from the audience uh, that is sort of basic question, uh, mostly directed towards uh, Dr. Heyran Nia about the definition of middle class. When we say middle class, you know, which groups of people are, do we have in mind? Uh, the humanity, th thanks so much for uh, this question. Uh, it's uh, so hard to uh, define the basic concept in the humanity. Uh, uh, but according to Marx, um, uh, middle class define, uh, uh, define economically. But uh, according, to, according to Max Weber, uh, it define, he, de he defines uh, middle class uh, as, a, uh, as a group, uh, as a class, uh, culturally, but uh, in this uh, in this work, uh, 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 me and uh, Professor Manshipuri um, consider the uh, Max Weber definition of a middle class. Uh, in Iran, it uh, it refers to um, three deciles, uh, fifths, sixths, and sevenths decile of uh, economic deciles. Uh, a group uh, can afford, can afford uh, basically needs and um, try to uh, try to have a standard, uh, a starting, a standard living. Uh, so, um, uh, so in Iran, uh, this class, uh, uh, this class salaries is more than uh, four hundred and fifty dollar uh, in amounts. So basically, it's about income distribution, uh, um, and uh, of course, as both of you presented, this the sanctions, at least, is one of the uh, causes of the loss of value of this income, and, and therefore the sort of um, falling into the lines of poverty from the middle class. Thank you so much for that. There's a related question uh, that. Uh, that possibly more also related to the first question I asked, uh, that if, if the uh, <clears throat> consequence of, at least one of the consequences of these sanctions is the weakening of the reformist uh, faction in, uh, in uh, the Iranian state, uh, could one deduce from that that the other faction, the conservatives, the Usul Gerayan, the principalists, uh, would actually like to see the continuation of sanctions because it basically helps them to marginalize their uh, political competitors in Iran. Let me address this question. This is a very interesting question. Actually, I thought about it last night and I was waiting for this question and thank you. This is a wonderful question. Uh, there is this argument that the major beneficiary of sanctions in Iran have been the Revolutionary Guard. And I don't know objectively to what extent we can actually verify that by saying that, you know, there is evidence that the major beneficiary of sanctions have been Revolutionary Guards, the IRGC. But, but I know that uh, a portion of Iranian oil revenue is earmarked for the uh, uh, Revolutionary Guard. And Revolutionary Guards certainly 
are in contact with middlemen and one can talk about uh, Babak Zanjani, for instance, uh, who was the middleman, a billionaire who lived in Dubai and was able to uh, find ways to bypass the sanctions. And definitely was supported by some members in the Revolutionary Guard. And today, the reason that he has been arrested is that you know he owes $1.7 billion or something uh, as a result of selling oils and some other things, but uh, he's not giving this money to Iran because he says, look, you know, give me a bank account, I can deposit that. You cannot, uh, you know, you're not allowed to have a bank account. But there is no question that there were a lot of, when you are doing things that are not legal and they're not transparent, when you are in the business of transactions with uh, parties that are middlemen, and if you are selling something uh, to uh, you know uh, North Korea or Vietnam, and this is money has to go to the third party, and then from third party has to be deposited in certain banks so that the Iranians will get access to that. When 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 things are not transparent, there are a lot of middlemen that are benefiting from that, and I cannot help for life of me that Sepah, the Sepah mini revolutionary guards are not in touch with this middleman. They were in touch mm -hmm. and they could very well benefit from it. So, uh, so this is something that uh, one cannot ignore. And, and it's a very important point that there are some people who benefit from sanctions in Iran, and, and despite the fact that vast majority of Iranian people are suffered under this sanction. Dr. Hirania, do you want to add anything to? I had I had uh, some interviews with uh, Richard Nephew, and uh, I one time I asked him, uh, "Did you consider ordinary people when uh, when you design sanctions?" He he said to me, "Yes, we." Our sanctions uh, against Iran is very uh, smart, and uh, its target is uh, Iran, Iran regime. But uh, why, what I said to him, uh, the government uh, can can turn around the sanction, and the uh, real impacts of sanction is are on the ordinary people, and the uh, sanctions led to. Uh, lead, uh, leads to um, uh, corruption and mm -hmm. in this uh, in this field um, uh, some uh, some organization can uh, can better can better benefit yeah that's so true uh, there is uh, another question on uh, the uh, iranian state's response to this uh, trend of uh, middle classes falling below poverty line what kind of how are they managing it how how the state is responding to this uh, obviously uh, you know this is something that would turn sooner or later the the fact that the, all these protests are now have economic uh, objectives but nevertheless this generates a certain kind of predicament for the state, how the state is responding to this? For both of you. Dr. Herania, can you go first? Would you like to go first? Um, yeah. I would like to, I would like to uh, answer this question with the future of reformism. Uh, although reformism is a continuous process, uh, the hardcore of power in Iran has limited always for, for the real reformists to play an effective role. Accordingly, we are witnessing middle class moves into social networks and influence through this. According uh, to Khatami's political advisor, Mohammad Tajik, reformism is moving toward insurgent reformism, which is neither a form of a government that allows allows the oligarchy to rule in the name of the people, nor a form of a society 
organized by the power of the goods. Well, I might add that uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Ruz that um, Iran has had an elaborate system of subsidy. And especially under Ahmadinejad, it worked to the best interest of the people who lived in certain rural area. But also under uh, President Hassan Rouhani, the, the system of subsidies continued. And, and people uh, to this very day, under different groups, they get different types of subsidies. That what the, the sanctions on oil industry of Iran has done has really adversely affected that subsidies. You know, so when Hassan Rouhani went uh, on, on saying that, look, we have to increase the price of, you know, the price of gas because, uh, you know, this is not, you know, the standard uh, 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 benchmark for selling the gas at this price. We can no longer subsidize that. The unrest and protests started. So Iranians have found themselves in catch-22. On the one side, they would like to keep, you know, the try to try to throw something at the lower classes so that they can, they can live at least at the edge of subsistence and to protect them. But on the other hand, they don't have the budget; they don't have enough money in their budget in the coffers to cover that. So this is where the dilemma is, and that's why it seems to me that at some point, revolutionary guards. I remember I'm reading something that they have said that, look, we have to come to the rescue of the lower classes because we may as well be witnessing the beginning of a new revolution by the lower classes. So revolutionary guards were smart enough to realize that they have to work on subsidies, especially targeted to the lower classes. Otherwise, things are going to get crazy and rapidly get out of hand on the street level. So they, they actually, uh, they actually uh, uh, admonish the regime to that effect. But then again, you have balancing acts and overlapping uh, and conflicting sometimes interests. On the one hand, Revolutionary Guard says to the leadership that you have to address the needs of the poor by subsidy and so on and so forth. But on the other hand, Revolutionary Guard is very much committed to promoting proxies and sending money to Lebanon, sending money to uh, 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 to uh, Iraq and other places. So how can you do a balancing act at the time that you are suffering from you know, uh, sanctions? And how can you do a balancing act between you know, providing the lower classes with the money they need and subsidizing them as best as you can? But at the same time, you're sending money to Lebanon, you're sending money to, uh, to Iraq, to, to Syria, and uh, um, not to Yemen, but certainly to Palestine, to Hamas. So how can you do that? This really requires a tremendous act of juggling so many balls and so many things with two hands, which is making it very difficult for the regime to handle all the situation uh, at the same time. But then, it, uh, you know, this is the regime that has survived, uh, continues to survive. Um, apparently, they have, they have found some ways of actually addressing some of these problems. But it's very explosive situation right now. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Uh, unfortunately, we are uh, very, very close to uh, the uh, end of our conversation, but I just wanted to mention another question that uh, possibly there is no answer to uh, that question, uh, that whether or not the uh, nuclear talks with Iran um, would uh, shed some light on the, the American uh, nuclear uh, military programs and the fact that that um, that the U.S. spends more than three hundred billion dollar a year stockpile stewardship programs, and uh, and is there any possibility that that these negotiations would would lead to shining some sort of light on on the the American side's uh, use of uh, nuclear uh, programs? Uh, but uh, I think. Uh, the quick answer to that is no, <laughs> but, but since we are also coming to the end of the hour, I would like to uh, really thank again both of you, Dr. Heiran Nia and Professor Munshi Puri, for joining us, accepting this uh, invitation. Hopefully, 
uh, next time we have the same conversation on other topics in person in Princeton. So we can show you the uh, famous Princetonian hospitality uh, and, uh, and, um, and enjoy your uh, thoughts and, and wisdom on these very, very important issues. Thank you again um, and uh, till next time very soon. Not obliged. Okay. Bye now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Javad. Thank you so much, yeah. Dr. Behrouz. Thank you. And dear audience okay. for bye -bye. attending bye -bye. to yeah. this uh, webinar. Thanks so yeah. much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye now.